the whole point of today's uh, lecture is to finish up partisan news and new media that started before spring break, before, you know, we've all been locked in our homes, especially if you're in Ohio, and also go over the uh, midterm exam that will happen Thursday through Saturday. A uh, brief spoiler, it's 30 questions in total, 26 are multiple choice, and then four are short answer. And at the end, fingers crossed, YouTube won't turn us off. It, it shouldn't be copyrighted material. We'll find out. Fingers crossed it won't be. Uh, I do have a brief review session after we finish all this lecture stuff. So I'm just going to go through all the slides, not give too much explanation, but just go through them, especially if you have not had a chance to return to campus and get all of your notes. It would be worthwhile for you to see this stuff, replay this video at a later time, especially when you're trying to figure out exactly how to prepare for the exam. So, ah, uh, it seems like it was just yesterday. Of course, don't forget about the functions of news media. Uh, let's make sure I move this. Da, 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 da. That's probably better. All right. Don't forget about what political uh, knowledge should be. Setting the agenda. What salience is. What are the two ways that agenda setting works? Da, 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 da. I will tell you in a minute. It's been such a long time, y'all. when technology doesn't work right. For some reason, my personal computer is not doing what it should be doing. And so that's irritating. Uh, the two ways in which agenda setting works. Uh, way one, media coverage uh, cues a heuristic decision-making rule shortcut. I mean, uh, Media coverage cues a heuristic decision-making rule, which is also known as short circuit processing. And then the second way is personal concern for the issue leads the individual to read more news stories about the topic and judge its importance. And that is known as systematic processing. And so of course, recall this nasty graph from before uh, spring break, the way in which uh, hey, Danny, the way in which the agenda setting model, the way in which agenda setting works. From before uh, spring break, the way in which I... So now we got a little uh, feedback. That's not good. So let's see. Figure out a way so that way... Danny, you're not on the live stream. It's a mad sketch. One moment. No, well, we're just here now. We're here now. <laughs> we're here. So, of course, recall that, of course, uh, major no, there are gatekeepers in certain events that take place. Uh, and then, of course, there's a the media agenda, which influences the public agenda, which ultimately influences the policy agenda. But there is a circular feedback process for both personal experience and interpersonal communication, as well as real indicators of issue importance. And so while the media tries to inform the public agenda as well as the policy and ultimately the policy agenda, there are some external circumstances that makes the agenda setting process change. The best example of this is nobody was prepared for the coronavirus. Well, I mean, not no one, but surely America wasn't. It was like literally the beginning of the semester, which seems like such a long time ago. Wuhan virus, it was relatively novel. It was like, oh, there's, there's this weird virus going on in Asia. And now look at us, we're stuck in our rooms. Oh, Wu has shut down and I'm teaching online. 
And that is an example of a major event, as well as it has indicators of, of real world indicators of importance. I mean, what, doesn't everybody in Italy just about has it? And apparently, I think before the end of the week, America will have, what, more cases than Italy, which is wild. So how's that for an example of agenda setting? No one's talking about the 2020 election anymore. I mean, is it still happening? It's still just Uncle Joe and Bernie, right? Nobody's really talking about the election. We're all trying to make sure we don't die from the virus. And of course, recall that we talked about how agenda setting influences voting, the five-step process for agenda settings influence on voting, Individuals can't pay close attention to everything. The media tries to determine which issues come to mind via agenda setting. Once the media sets the agenda, they can prime voters. And of course, priming votes the way, uh, influences the way people vote. And then of course, ultimately priming is the psychological concept that describes how a prior stimulus influences reactions to a subsequent message. And so of course, Stated before, priming describes the impact of the media agenda on the criteria of voters to use, that the criteria voters use to evaluate candidates. So if an election was held tomorrow, or yeah, if the presidential election was held tomorrow, one of the first uh, issues, primary issues that we voters would use to evaluate the president is the response to the coronavirus. Why? Because that's on everyone's tongues right now. Is there anything else people are talking about? That stimulus bill, will we get that $1,000 check? But that's still related to the coronavirus. So, priming. I'm checking the live chat. No, no one's checking for, for Cuomo for president. And what you mean you're not worried about uh, corona in Florida? Y'all got all those spring breakers down there. Y'all are going to be like ground zero, Nick. Ain't nobody thinking about Florida. We're trying to saw it off like the Bugs Bunny cartoon. So, of course, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, yeah, you have the CDC. There's like a whole bunch. Like, I'm worried about my grandmother in Atlanta. Not in Atlanta, but yeah, Georgia. <sighs> y'all are, y'all are on track to be worse than Augusta. Anyways, so of course, we were talking about agenda setting and priming in the recent elections. And ultimately, what's really going on as issues uh, compete for attention and their proponents, lobbyists, activists, and ideologues, these all these individuals must persuade. Yes, Ohio is shut down. This is why I'm stuck in my room. Anyways, they must persuade policymakers to devote time and money. If an issue isn't defined as a problem by the media or political elites, it can't move through the stages necessary for a problem to be contemplated, considered, discussed, and solved. When media directs their focus on an issue, a policy agenda can diffuse throughout society, leading to policy change. And then finally, agenda playing plays an important role in democracy by providing a path through which media and political institutions can sow the seeds for change. Anything else? <laughs> All these various things. So, of course, agenda setting in the interwebs. So, as we talked about before, conventional journalists no longer dictate the media agenda. Uh, the, inter the intermedia agenda refers to the ways in which particular outlets set the agenda for other media and news in general. It's similar to PAC journalism, except PAC journalism focuses on what goes on within one news branch. So the example I would give would be back during a prior uh, pandemic, the Ebola crisis, uh, there were various narratives that started for PAC, for PAC journalism within CNN. Wolf Blitzer would argue that this is the explanation as to why Ebola is spreading the way that it is in Africa. And then next thing you know, we would see, gosh, I can't remember the other person that was there. But of course, Anderson Cooper at all, they would all give explanations and provide commentary similar to the commentary Wolf Blitzer first espoused. And so that's PAC journalism. Intermedia agenda setting, however, focuses on the ways in which, so let's say, I can't recall who was the first source, news source that reported on the coronavirus. Who was it? Who was it? Who was it? Who 
was it? It wasn't the Washington Post. And it wasn't Bloomberg. Who was the, who first reported the coronavirus? So let's just say for this example, it was, well, yeah, we know China, like who was the first person, who was the first news source to let us know that they were eating the bats in Wuhan, China? And that the uh, Chinese people were falling out in public. I, it wasn't the Washington Post. Who was it? Anyways, the point is, let's say for the sake of this example, it was the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal was the first one that let the world know, and by the world, I'm just talking about the U.S. of A., know that there is this virus coming out of China that is knocking people out, making them pass out where they stand and killing them like nobody's business. And we don't know what the disease is and we don't know how to cure it. And we are literally three months away from all becoming the walking dead. And so after the Wall Street Journal, you know, reported this, everybody else, the Washington Post, the New York Times, uh, LA Times, et cetera, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, they all have to cite in this example, the Wall Street Journal for bringing this to our attention. That's intermedi intermediate agenda setting. So meanwhile, social media plays a totally different role in agenda setting, provides pathways to construct partisan agendas as online messages reinforce salient beliefs and diffuse among like-minded followers, uh, influences via media leaders uh, in a net, influences, <clears throat> influences opinion leaders in a networked two-step flow, and then finally exerts a direct role in agenda building. That's it. So of course, what are the official voting considerations? Well, going back, I see uh, Max said that uh, it's a bold statement to say that we are the world. If you recall from uh, this section before this one, when we were talking about political knowledge and information, it shows that we Americans, we do not pay attention to international news, that we focus primarily on what's going on domestically, and that in comparison to other first world countries like Norway, the UK, and others, this was in uh, Iyengar, I want to say chapter two or three, or the role of press and democracy, it shows that we Americans know very, very little about the international world, about international developments, and that when we think about what's going on in the world, we're only focusing on what happens to us within the U.S. of A. So that's why I said it that way. Anyways, voting considerations, these are similar to the five, what's it calls it? Not the five, what's it calls it? The five, what's it calls it's for the five factors that influences one's vote choice. Of course, party ID is the most important. And then we also then have approval of the incumbent president, uh, retrospective judgments about the economy, uh, the state of national security, and then finally salient issues. What issues are of importance for this upcoming election? And so uh, I can't believe I didn't take this down. We'll talk more about this after the midterm because I, you know, I think I know that for our remaining, what, four weeks, three to four weeks, we'll just be talking about campaign effects. It's a shame that I have to teach this all online. Uh, and since YouTube likes to stop people's streams, if you stream uh, content, the way that I think it'll ultimately work is, is that, I don't know, can I just stop streams? share the video via Zoom, and then we jump back in. I don't know, I'll figure that out. Otherwise, I'll just send the links, uh, pause for like 90 seconds or whatever, then jump into explanations of it, and then we can have delayed reactions that way. But it's like, it's weird to have a media and politics class online, and I can't share the media, it sucks. Anyways, we'll talk more about campaign effects after the midterm. And so that means we don't need to learn anything about the reinforcement effect that's post spring break 
not spring break, the midterm, uh, determinants of turnout, like what are the factors that influences you to turn out to vote? We could all just join in a Zoom call and you can show us the stuff there. Well, apparently Owu didn't sign up for the uh, big package for Zoom. So I think I'm only limited to four people on a Zoom call. And I think there's like 20 odd of y'all, 20 and some change. So I have to figure, yeah, like I said, I have to think about that a little bit more. But no, Owu did not uh, chip in for the actual package. So we have basic Zoom. Anyways, determinants of turnout, electoral context, citizen attributes, and campaigns. In terms of electoral context, is uh, we're talking about the significance of a race as well as competitiveness. Are we talking about the county coroner? Are we talking about city council, the mayor? Are we talking about a state senator? Or are we talking about, you know, U.S. Congress? Are we talking about the U.S. senator? Are we talking about the president, the governor? And then, of course, the competitiveness going back to, uh, yeah, Atlanta Congress. Are we talking about, you know, John Lewis running for reelection for the umpteen time? Or are we talking about one of these newer districts? Uh, that I can't remember the exact number of the district, but the district out in Texas where the uh, only black Republican, Will Hurd, is choosing not to run for reelection. And it's rumored that Beto O'Rourke is supposed to be actually running for that seat. Maybe a really competitive seat. We'll see. We don't know what's going on in politics, you know, coronavirus. And then, of course, citizen attributes. SES, socioeconomic status. Uh, if you decide to take voters and elections with me this fall, if we all get the green light to leave our houses, uh, we talk about the ways in which income influences vote choice and as well as actually encourages one's propensity to vote. And so believe it or not, the more money you have, the more likely you are to vote. Now, why is that the case, Dr. Mack? Well, that is because uh, with SES, poor people cannot afford to actually turn out and vote. They can't afford to take the time off work to uh, stand in line for hours on end. Because you've seen uh, for cases of Super Tuesday, in some states, there were individuals that were stuck in line for hours on end. So like if you are poor or you work a job that has fewer opportunities for breaks, you're less likely to vote because like you can't afford to take that time off to stand in a line and vote for a person that actually may not even win the election. Uh, age, the older you are, the more likely you are to vote. Uh, partisanship, uh, believe it or not, Republicans turn out more often than Democrats do. But regardless of that, uh, the stronger your partisanship is, so being a strong D or a strong R, you're far more likely to turn out to vote and you're far more likely to turn out to vote for every single election. So not just the major presidential election that happens every four years, you also turn out for the midterm cycle elections or every two years, and then you then also show up for these random special elections that happen like once a year in May or July. I think in Atlanta, not Atlanta, uh, Georgia, they've pushed back our primary to June, which is really random. But like that is an example of it, that everybody with a strong D or a strong R, they'll show up to vote in the primary in June. And then campaigns. What about, uh, is it uh, encouraging people to vote or is it turning people off to vote? It depends on the nature of the campaign. Are we trying to promote unity? And are we trying to mobilize certain facets of the group? Uh, one could argue that for the longest time, Bernie Sanders was trying to mobilize young people. And then especially for Joe Biden in South Carolina, he was trying to do his damnedest to mobilize black people to turn out the vote. It worked. I mean, Tom Steyer tried to do the same thing too with juvenile, but you know, we all know how that turned out. And so, of course, we talked about the transformation of information technology. We talked about uh, the differences between point-to-point -point communications as well as broadcast communications. Uh, we talked about uh, the two schools of thought concerning the impact of new media. We have optimists and skeptic, skip, skeptimists. Skeptics, <laughs> optimists see technology as a means of revitalizing the public sphere. Skeptics, skeptics believe that technology won't help account for the limitations of conventional news and programming. 
Then we also talked about motivated reasoning and selective exposure. Exposure. Uh, basically, all motivated reasoning is, is just the form of reasoning in which people access, uh, construct, and evaluate arguments in a biased fashion to arrive at or endorse a preferred conclusion. Selective exposure, people tend to favor information that reinforces their pre-existing views while avoiding uh, contradictory information. These are related but separate concepts, as I stated before. Motivated reasoning, people engaging in motivated reasoning will spend far more energy trying to refute contrary information. Meanwhile, those under selective exposure choose not to expose themselves to any new information or to anything that contradicts their pre-held beliefs. All they do for selective exposure is consume information and consume media that reinforces their previously, priorly, priorly, previously held beliefs, pre-existing views. Motivated reasoning they spend most of their energy refuting and contradicting this new information, spending time saying this is wrong. It's like the random Republican on a liberal website, on a liberal, uh, yeah, on a liberal blog. It's like the one person that you see explaining why all this stuff in this article that is on a Democratic website, why all that information is wrong. That person is engaging in motivated reasoning. Meanwhile, if we sit, then continue with this example and say a Republican blog, and we see nothing but Republican commentary on an article on this Republican blog, and it's all just agreeing with whatever the entry was, that's an example of selective exposure, I would argue, because these are all individuals, the Republican commentary, these are individuals who are choosing to continue to consume information and consume blogs, et cetera, consume media that reinforces or confirms their prior held beliefs. And so I hope y'all turn that in. That was like our last assignment. So, of course, we were talking about blog consumption by party ID. Uh, we find that, let's see, in terms of ideology, uh, we see that huh, if you're a strong L, a strong liberal, you're far more likely to actually consume both left and right blogs. Uh, similar for party ID, strong Democrats are more likely to consume both left and right blogs as opposed to Democrats. But ultimately, it's in terms of party ID, strong D's and strong R's are more likely to consume, but with strong Democrats consuming a little bit more. And so, of course, what are some of the causes of media bias? We talked about them. Here they are. And then what are some of the effects of media bias? May or may not be a question on the midterm. And of course, partisan media. Where am I now? Da, 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 da. It's weird because like this computer is now being used as the projector, and so I so I have to have my personal computer then show all my notes, which is like boo. So we talked about the uh, three, not three, uh, perceptions of media bias, uh, the norm. Norms and rules for newsmaking, which is also known as news values, should ultimately prevent journalists from slanting the news. And so there are three types of media bias. Uh, ideological bias. Oh, hey, Jose. Are you also stuck? That's random. Okay. Anyways, ideological bias, affective bias, and informational bias. So let's get into the types of biases. Ideological bias refers to one's personal political ideology and or preferences affecting a person's perception and understanding of an issue. Uh, so basically a liberal leaning or conservative leaning bias. Uh, it's the most common type of political media bias. Uh, ideological bias is also known as partisan bias uh, within this understanding of ideological bias, we have one, two, three concepts. Uh, the first one being the hostile media effect. Uh, under the hostile media effect, uh, partisans view news coverage as biased against their own viewpoint. Uh, so under the hostile media effect, any type of media, or not any type, 
any type that goes against what they identify towards their bias, they say it's wrong, it's not fair, it's only showing one side or another, not at one side or another, it's showing the opposite side. Uh, for branded partisan news slant, uh, it refers to news from a certain perspective the reader is aware of. So if we continue with the stereotypical uh, Republican lean, that the, par the branded partisan news slant is, I only watch news from Fox News. That's it. That's the only perspective I'm aware of. That's the only perspective that matters. And then finally, a partisan news slant refers to covert news bias parading as objectivity. So I'm trying to think of what news source, news source, quote unquote, could be considered a partisan news slant? It wouldn't be the blaze. I mean, because does Tommy Lauren work for the Republican Party? Is there anyone within the Republican Party or heck, even within the Democratic Party that's an actual journalist and has their own news site? Or even if it's a partisan news blog? Is there? Anyways, for that person, for that journalist, he or she, if they also work for the party and they have their news site, that would be a partisan news slant. And so uh, more information about the hostile media effect, uh, out white persuasion by uh, covert news messages is extremely rare. Uh, in fact, research shows that audiences actively select the news that they are exposed to. The second type of bias, affect by affect, affect, affective bias. This is also known as an emotional bias. Uh, it refers to emotional responses to situations that affects one's perception and understanding of an issue. Uh, it can be a positive or a negative emotional response. Uh, affective bias can be caused by critical news content on the government, politicians, and policies. Uh, it can also refer to negativity and cynicism in coverage. Uh, there are multiple uh, effects and consequences to uh, affective bias. It can lead to a decline in political participation, trust in the government, and trust in media. Uh, also encourages people to keep their partisan identities secret. I think we talked about that before at spring break, but apparently that there are conservative students and Republican students on campus that feel that they have to keep their identities secret. I guess, you know, now that we're home now, we can all enjoy our times out of the closet now that we're home. Because, I mean, who's going to see? Who's going to check you? But, you know, as I stated before, I feel like anybody, like, I don't care what you identify as. You know, my only goal as a professor is to make sure that you understand why you identify the way that you identify and that you are able to articulate your positions on various issues. So it's more than just, I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican because my mama was a Republican and my daddy was a Republican, etc. I want you to be able to articulate that you are a Republican because you believe in X, Y, and Z, and this is what the party stands for on those same issues, and so I align myself as such. You can even, you know, be team brony or identify as a libertarian or you believe vermin supreme is the next messiah. So long as you, you can articulate the reasons why you roll with Vermin Supreme, that's all I care about. But I will side eye you if you like Vermin Supreme. Just, just on principle. That's the only one. Believe whatever you want so long as it's not Vermin Supreme. Uh, and then also, finally, it somewhat encourages attention to news developments. More on affective bias. I said that negative affect uh, is far more responsive than positive affect. Uh, negative emotions uh, primed in stories include negativity, incivility, rudeness, cynicism, dislike, and distrust. Uh, negativity sells. Right now, news media sources provide speaking opportunities to ideologically extreme congressmen as opposed to moderates because they promote such passionate negativity. Uh, coverage of ads also contribute to negativity in political news. Uh, it creates incentives for politicians to use negative ads because they'll receive far more coverage and there's no such thing as bad publicity. I take that back. There is such a thing as bad publicity. I talked about it in Black Politics today. I know Nick is going to be like, here we go. But Andrew Gillum, y'all, 
If you haven't seen the news stories or the articles, Google it. It was a wild mess that happened during spring break. Uh, if you don't recall who Andrew Gillum is during the 2018 midterm election, he was the black man that was running for governor of Florida. He ultimately lost, but it was a razor thin uh, edge that DeSantis won uh, the election. Anyways, he was arrested in a sting. He was found in a hotel room uh, vomiting, allegedly from heroin and meth. Uh, the gigolo, he was in there with a, a male prostitute, a gigolo, uh, who had overdosed on the medicine, but they found Andrew Gillum laid out. Why does this matter? Because he is married with children. And it was a mess. And so you can pretty much guarantee he can kiss his political career goodbye. But it was wild. It's weird how all this stuff is happening now that we're home. Because you best believe I would have played the video for you all. A uh, mess. But yeah, that affective bias, uh, it depends on the media sources that you're citing. So if you're looking within race-specific ones, uh, for African Americans, especially Black women, oh, it is uh, stirring up all these conversations around down-low men. These are men that are closeted gay black men that still have uh, families, married, and of course expose uh, their wives to HIV, et cetera, as a result of their unsafe practices uh, within the Democratic Party. It's bringing in questions of immorality because, you know, Andrew Gillum was out here partying and doing drugs with a male prostitute. Like, you don't want that kind of person high ranking within the party. It's all salacious. But yeah, it's drawing up all kinds of emotions. And then for myself, it's not even negativity or cynicism. On my end, it's it's enjoyment. <laughs> it's amusement. Because <laughs> I'm just like, you know, you just this this kind of stuff doesn't happen every day. I think the last time I was this amused was the Katie Hill sexting of last semester of the former uh, congresswoman from, it wasn't Arizona, California, that was out here sleeping with her staffers. And then her husband like leaked all her pictures and then the staffers pictures. And it was, it was a mess. It was also messy. And of course, I enjoy political messiness. Other examples of affective bias. Uh, currently, it's not BuzzFeed. I want to say it's the Washington Post or the Atlantic that keeps posting all these doom and gloom articles about uh, the coronavirus saying that we're going to be stuck indoors for the next 18 months. Ain't nobody trying to hear that. Just like they're saying that the recession is happening and, you know, 30% of Americans have lost their jobs or lost hours at work and the world's getting ready to end. Like, I ain't got that. I don't need to hear that. I already survived the Great Recession. I don't. I don't, don't tell me that I need to be in my house for another 18 months. I never bought my deep freezer. I don't have vegetables like that. I didn't want to be here, like in this house. I wanted to be in my own house. I don't have a bunker. I don't have like emergency rations. I don't have anything to fight against the walking dead when that happens. I'm not ready. So stop with the app, you know, with all the bad stuff. And then finally, information bias, the third type of media bias. Uh, it refers to the removal of information, context, or perspectives from the news. Uh, what happened last spring was not Omar. Yeah, Elon Omar's tweet. Uh, she had responded to, uh, what was it, the super PAC, the pro-Israel super PAC. Something had happened with that PAC, and she responded all about the Benjamins. And so what ended up happening was... Someone saw that and said, oh my gosh, that's anti-Semitic because she said all about the Benjamins. She's alluding that this pro-Israel super PAC is out here, you know, being corrupt, etc. But what ended up happening is her, the, uh, the original tweet that was announcing the developments of that PAC was removed, as well as her direct response. All that people were retweeting and repeating was Omar's tweet all about the Benjamins. And they're like, look, this is anti-Semitic. It led to her being censored by, was it Pelosi? No, I wasn't, it had to be Pelosi. Yep, because Nancy Pelosi was Speaker of the House last year. Yep, she was censored. And so without knowing that strategic piece of information up front, none of us really knew what was going on. Another example of uh, the Covington High School situation. I think we also talked about that one before the midterm. Uh, and then, of course, there are three types of information bias, personalization bias, dramatization bias, and fragmentation bias. Personalization bias focuses on the human interest side of a story, 
as opposed to a policy or political process. BuzzFeed is good for this. So if you want to know how people are dying in Italy, they will give you a play-by-play -play or like you see those articles. A 20-year-old has described how important it is for us to stay in the house. That's an example of personalization bias. Another one, Amy Klobuchar's husband is, you know, in the hospital suffering from the co uh, coronavirus. Another example of personalization bias. Uh, for dramatization bias, that's news organizations emphasizing the most dramatic elements of a story. Uh, fragmentation bias uh, only refers, not yet, yeah. fragmentation bias refers to related stories that are told in a manner that uh, isolates them from one another. And so within this fragmentation bias, we have episodic coverage and then thematic coverage Episodic coverage refers to uh, stories that only provide a snapshot of an event, while thematic coverage provides a broader view of problems, events, and issues. Episodic coverage, one person died from an illness, a mysterious illness. Thematic coverage, Italy has suffered, what, over, what is it, like 8,000 deaths? I think it's more than 8,000. It's a whole bunch. But I wanted to say yesterday it was positive information because they said there were fewer infections to that today's Tuesday, Monday, than there were on Sunday. And of course, I said, well, that's because they only have X amount of population. Eventually, it's going to it's going to, you know, reach full saturation. Eventually, the numbers will decrease. And then finally, authority disorder bias refers to a leader's ability to retain or restore order often after a political event or natural disaster. Uh, President Trump's daily coronavirus update is uh, his effort in trying to retain and restore order in spite of this whole coronavirus pandemic. And so what about fake news and information? Fake news, fake news is fake news. Of course, audiences seek com confirmation that their beliefs are uh, through media accounts, yeah. Audiences seek confirmation of their beliefs through media accounts and ultimately correcting false information can be difficult. Uh, let's see, on the Daily Mail, I found it yesterday. There was a Florida city councilman that had to retract an initial statement. He was out here telling the people that if you take a blow dryer and turn it on high and blow it up your nostrils, it'll be fine because temperatures of uh, blow dryers reach 136 degrees Fahrenheit and that's all that you need to kill the coronavirus that's entering your noses. That's how you get nosebleeds because you dry out your nasal lining and then that's a guaranteed way to make sure you get the coronavirus because no nasal linings and your nose bleeds and it exposes you, yeah. He had to come out with a statement. Uh, let's see. I read another example of this couple that was trying to get a hold of hydrochlorine. I think that's how you say it. Uh, that's, you know, that's the, uh, the chem not the chemical, but the medicine that Trump is trying to get the FDA to finish the research on so it can be used as a widespread treatment for coronavirus. Uh, <laughs> uh, this, anyways, this couple instead confuse the chemical for something that's used in aquariums and cleaning aquariums. And so they took that uh, aquarium chemical, uh, the husband died. Other examples of, uh, yeah, fake information. So of course, tell your older family members, your aunties, your uncles, your grandparents, family, friends, don't, don't believe everything they read on the internet. There's another one I've read. I have a cousin that's out here promoting that the coronavirus isn't real. Uh, I know it was a meme that, uh, what's it called, it sent me, JP sent me, saying that the stay-at-home orders are not real. Please, please don't take the uh, medicine, Cassidy. I would, I, I don't want you to die. Anyways, <laughs> but is Shamu still alive, though? Anyways, that... The coronavirus isn't real, that the stay-at-home orders exist to uh, give the government enough time to change all of the batteries on the birds. Because remember, you know, the birds aren't real. They are just, you know, surveillance drones. And so, of course, we all have to stay in the house, especially here in Ohio, so the government can have enough time to change the batteries. Of course, we all know that's not real. And then the other one saying all these celebrities that say they have 
the coronavirus. Now there's one that's related to whole Pedogate and uh, Podesta and all that. Now that's and Jeffrey Epstein. That's one. That's one rabbit hole. The other rabbit hole is all the celebrities that say they have the virus are faking and they are just doing so to promote terror within the rest of the world. Because if they truly had this coronavirus, why aren't they spitting up blood? So this is all fake news and misinformation. The coronavirus is real. Stay in the house, buy your groceries. If you live in states or in areas that the, that the authorities have told you to shelter in place, for the love of God, shelter in place. Okay? Okay. To let the government change the light bulb on the sun? I mean, but it's sunlight now. I don't... Wh why wouldn't they do that at night? I have questions. All these questions. Of course, this is how you can detect bias in the news media. And so we, this is where we finally stopped uh, before spring break. The world is flat. The world is not flat. When we're thinking about <laughs> exactly how does the media, if we could put the media on a spectrum between liberal and conservative, as well as the amount of true facts that exist within the media, this is actually what it looks like. Uh, this chart is from mediabias.com, mediabiaschart.com, as well as research. It's a uh, researcher that, I'm trying to remember the name of the woman, it's a woman. But unfortunately, I still can't show the video because, you know, YouTube will shut me down. Anyways, uh, a woman that has sat down and collected all the sources, major sources across the world, or not across the world, within American political discourse and placed them on a spectrum from liberal to conservative, and then as well as from reporting, or you know, original fact reporting to just fake fabricated information. So if you want to know what are the, and then it, then it also has categories for, you know, uh, mainstream, leans conservative, liberal, et cetera. And so let's see, if you want to know what is top notch, your mainstream news that contains the least amount of partisan bias, that's the Associated Press and Reuters. And then Bloomberg, which is like weird because, you know, you know, Bloomberg ran for president. ABC News, CBS, NBC News. If you want to know what's your most liberal, but wrong, 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 wrong. If you want your conservative version of it, that's uh, Alex Jones and his info wars. The liberal counterpart to that just hot mess, patriotics. Uh, if you want to know liberal leaning and it's un it's not unbiased but it's biased so selective or incomplete so you see you have your huffington post and your buzzfeed news your conservative uh counterparts the american conservative and the washington times if you want a little bit better but it's still leaning you got your new yorker liberal side and then you have your reason.com and your national review on the right side And I see we're still uh, arguing about whether or not the world is flat on the live chat. And then, of course, in terms of quality, CNN, which does lean a little bit to the left. But yes, CNN has fallen in quality. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. If you want to know what is absolutely not news at all, the Daily Mail. The Daily Mail is not news. In fact, Wikipedia last spring announced that they would not accept citations that contain the Daily Mail. Of course, which is hilarious because, you know, we academics, we don't want you all to write papers and cite Wikipedia. Weird. That's weird. Weird. I guess it's saying idle time, but I still exist, y'all. Yeah, so yeah, Zoom said it was just me, and so they shut us down after 40 minutes. 
But I still exist, y'all. We still in here. So where were we? Vanity Fair, The Daily Beast, etc. What's going on here? Okay. All right, so let's talk about how partisans polarize America. So, of course, this is the Levandusky reading that y'all were supposed to have done a long, 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 long time ago uh, when we talk about uh, demographics party breakdown. Uh, let's see. So the types of people that watch Fox News versus MSNBC. So we see for the uh, aspects of it. Uh, let's see. Average age that watches no partisan news, 53 um, percent male, 41 percent. Caucasians, 84, lives in the South, 26, etc. Shows more stats. And he pulled these from the National Annenberg Election Study. Uh, he also shows that between 2000 and 2010, it shows that it shows the uh, percentage of Democrats and Republicans who sometimes or regularly watch Fox News. That, you know, beginning back in the day when Fox News was first created, it was equal amounts. However, by 2004, that changed where it was, you see an increase in the amount of Republicans who choose to watch Fox News, while the number of people, Democrats who watch Fox News continue to decline in such a way that, in fact, it's growing. In fact, it's almost 70 percent of the uh, people polled watch, 70 percent of Republicans polled watch uh, Fox News on a fairly regular basis, sometimes or regularly, while it's, what, pushing down to 35 percent of Democrats. And so I pulled this chart from Dave, uh, not Dave, Doug Aller and Gary Suave. Uh, on average, 32% uh, of Democrats uh, are gay, lesbian, or not, not, wait, try that again, messed up. One more time. On average, Americans thought that 32% of Democrats are gay, lesbian, or bisexual. Uh, the correct answer is 6%. Likewise, Americans thought that 38% of Republicans made more than $250,000 a year. The correct answer is actually 2%. And so like all this chart shows is the perceived composition of Democratic supporters as well as the perceived composition of Republican supporters. This ties back into when I was asking you all to describe the average Democrat, the average Republican, what you all think is the average person that watches MSNBC or the average person that watches Fox News. And it was because I was trying to get at those stereotypes. Uh, let's see. Uh, Aller and Saad go on from there to say that Americans overestimate the uh, percentage of Democrats who are Black, who are union members, or who are atheists. Uh, they also overestimate the percentage of Republicans who are elderly, evangelical Christian, or Southerners. Uh, these misperceptions are even worse when people are evaluating the opposite party. Democrats overestimate the fraction of Democrats who are union members by 25 percent. Republicans overestimate it by 34 points. Republicans overestimate the fraction of Republicans who are wealthy by 30 points. Democrats overestimate it by 40 points. Uh, not depressed yet. It gets worse. Uh, you might think these misperceptions are concentrated among people who generally ignore politics, yet it's the opposite. People who pay attention to political news have worse misperceptions in almost every case. Giving money, uh, giving people money if they have the correct answer doesn't make estimates any more accurate. Telling people the overall percentage of Americans in each group which you might think would help people figure out the percentage of Democrats and Republicans in these groups actually made misperceptions worse. So contrary to what people think, no, the Democratic Party is not all rainbows and people of color. Minorities make up a really small part of the population within the Democratic Party. Just like in the Republican Party, everybody's not old, rich, and white. That's also like a small part of the party. 
And so, of course, uh, more about what Levandusky did in the book. I hope y'all have been reading, because, of course, you know, that midterm's coming up. He sought to answer the following questions. Does partisan media make citizens more polarized and divided? Does partisan media make citizens less trusting of the other side and less willing to compromise with them? Does partisan media shape how citizens behave in and understand elections? And then finally, if only, tiny, if only a tiny fraction of the population watches these shows, how can they have such important effects? And of course, one thing to make note of, partisan media, in this case, Lewandowski argues, is opinionated media. Uh, he argues that partisan media contributes to the difficulty in governing America. Uh, throughout the book, he shows partisan media polarizes attitudes. Uh, he shows that media increases polarization by not making moderates into extremes, but taking citizens who are already extreme and making them even more extreme. Uh, partisan media makes citizens more convinced that their views are the right ones, so they become less willing to believe the other side has something legitimate to offer. Uh, partisan media makes uh, citizens less willing to trust the other side, less willing to compromise with them, and thus contributing to gridlock. Uh, partisan media influences vote choice as well as how citizens understand elections. Uh, partisan media outlets make citizens more likely to accept nefarious interpretations when the other party wins elections, thus casting doubt on the legitimacy of the winner. Uh, Lewandowski then goes on to argue that partisan media, however, is important. Partisan media does matter because the audience is active and influential. Uh, those who watch partisan media are more involved and invested, and people who are politically influential make a large part of the audience. And so what does chapters two and three, which is what I assigned you all, say about, yeah, what does, what does partisan media actually say? Uh, so the three ways in which partisan media gives a distinct slant to daily news and events. Uh, the first way, they slant how they talk about the issues of the day, offering one-sided coverage of political controversies and debates and devoting disproportionate coverage to topics and issues that favor them. Uh, you will not see MSNBC reporting on new technologies that make the classification of an embryo into a fetus happen sooner. No, MSNBC is not going to report on that. Why? Because liberal leaning and, of course, that kind of information actually challenges their argument to pro-choice, while Fox News would be far more likely to report on new technology of that nature. Uh, the second way, uh, they talk about the other side in consistently negative terms. Uh, they criticize not only their policy positions, but also their motivations for enacting policies and particular issues to illustrate a more systematic approach, not systematic approach, systematic pattern of flawed behavior from the other side. Uh, these criticisms from the other side are oftentimes accompanied by declarations of being unable to work together or being against bipartisanship. And then the third way uh, for elections, these shows make it clear that the candidates viewers should uh, make it clear which uh, candidate viewers should support, not only supporting said candidate, but also denouncing the competition. I think it's easy to say that right now, if we look at liberal leaning, liberal leaning media, and even for uh, some of the mainstream media, I think the Democratic candidate of choice now is Biden, right? I think everyone's chosen, uh, chosen Uncle Joe, right? The people want Uncle Joe, right? Yes? Is an election still happening, y'all? And then, of course, we're showing uh, the various questions that were asked in his survey. Eventually, we'll co-opt these into uh, public opinion. And then, of course, we can talk about the role of social media in galvanizing protest. But we'll end up talking more so about that after the midterm. And so now, I guess, let's get into that review, right? Because I know that's what y'all want. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let us share the screen. What screen will I be sharing? Share. All right. 
it's not this one, it's this one. So of course, the way that this will work, if you haven't taken a class with me before, is I guess the way that we would do this, there are so, oh, Tulsi finally dropped out? When did that happen? Sheesh. I guess that's one good thing about the coronavirus. Tulsi finally dropped out. Anyways, the way that this will work, I'll look at the live chat. You pick which uh, letter you think is the correct answer. But these are some of the uh, questions that could appear on the midterm. As I said before, the midterm has 30 questions, 26 of which are multiple choice, four are short answer. Uh, the quiz, will, not the quiz, the midterm will go live 4 a.m. Thursday, and you'll have up until 11.59 p.m. Saturday. Uh, once you start your test, you'll have a 12-hour window to actually complete your test. Do not wait until the last minute. You will have until the end of your 12-hour window or 11.59 p.m. Saturday, whichever comes first. I will uh, try to be, not try to be, I will be responsive. If you have questions, unless you like message me four o'clock in the morning, then mm, I'll get to you when I wake up. So let's get into this. Oh, she dropped out last week, huh? That was spring break. Let's see. So shows like The Daily Show and Full Frontal, move out the way, employ a form of humor that uh, uses ridicule to expose human behavior, not human, human error. Uh, usually to deconstruct power surrounding said event or issue. Is this irony, satire, heuristic, or comedy? I have one for B. Make sure I have this up all the way. I guess we'll show it. Anyone else? Well, the answer is B. No, you don't have to register for this class. Nope, this is not a thing. Y'all don't have Top Hat. I only use it to review for exams. Oh, someone actually like tried to register? All right, but don't register. Second question. Blank is the way in which society transmits political orientations from generation to generation. Is this racial socialization, limited effects, cultivation theory, or political socialization? While I drink. Oh, for this question, I see, yeah, it's D, political socialization. Next question. Blank is a survey of the electorate conducted by media, politicians, researchers, or interest groups to record the public's political opinions and preferences. Are we talking about a focus group, a poll, an experimental survey, or an interview? We 
We have two for pole. Three for pole. Just to give everybody a chance to answer or just let the clock run out. What time is it? Hmm. It's Paul. Blank is an organizing theme or narrative that gives meaning to an event or series of events. Is it a prime, a narrative, a frame, or a trigger? I don't know what song I should sing. Toss a coin to your witcher, oh valley of plenty, oh valley of plenty. Whoa. Toss a coin to your witcher, a friend of humanity. Yes, I'm watching the witcher. <laughs> I'm on episode two. So yes, I got my song and I've been singing the song. But anyways, what's the answer to this question? I got one for C. C, that's the answer. So you remember we talked about priming effects, episodic, all that good stuff. The primary effect of episodic framing on viewers' understanding of the importance of responsibility in relation to criminal justice, yeah, so we're going to apply concepts, is to, let's say, A, increase their reliance on dispositional or individualistic accounts of political problems. So basically to conclude that crime is caused by immoral people. Is it to make them more likely to cite societal accounts of political problems, i.e. to conclude that crime is caused by inequality and racial discrimination? Is it to make viewers less prepared to offer any causal account of political problems? Or is it to increase their reliance on both individualistic and societal accounts? So of course, episodic framing, this one bad one thing happened. They just talk about it, this one bad thing. Are we all saying C is the answer? No, it's A. Why is it A, Dr. Mac? The reason why it is A is because it's focusing on this one event. So this one person, so if we use a robbery or a murder, this one person committed this atrocious, atrocious crime and we focus on the uh, perpetrator's motivations for doing so. It's not tied to perhaps this larger theme or this larger narrative about say, let's say just Mart of the uh, marginalized community or just the lack of access to X, Y, and Z, when you start getting those types of explanations, we're now instead talking about episodic framing, we're talking about thematic framing. But when we're talking about one event in isolation, the only thing that a person can do as a result of watching a story using episodic framing is focus on the details within that one case. And so as a result, it encourages people to focus on individualistic accounts of political problems to conclude that crime is just caused by bad people. News coverage is said to interact with personal circumstances in setting an individual's agenda. Which of the following demonstrates this? Lead stories are more powerful than ordinary stories in setting the agenda. Elderly people are more responsive to news coverage of social security. 
unemployed people are less responsive to news coverage of outsourcing or more informed viewers of TV news are more likely to have their agendas set. Toss a coin to your witcher, O Valley of Plenty. So we got two for B. Let's say the rest of ye. The answer is B. Yes, elderly people are more responsive to news coverage of Social Security. Fox News and the Huffington Post have both emerged as market leaders in cable television as well as in the blog marketplace. Their success suggests that News organizations owned by Murdoch have a comparative advantage. Highly prestigious news sources attract a larger market share. Uh, organizations with a conservative bias attract a larger audience. Or consumers with strong political views will gravitate to news sources they find agreeable. We have one for D, two for D. The answer is D. Consumers with strong political views gravitate to news sources they find agreeable. Which of the following statements describe the attentive public hypothesis? It's one of those three theories of selective exposure. So, you know, go back in and study those. Seeking out political information is a matter of political, generic political interest. People absorbed by politics tune in to all forms of news while the rest tune out politics. Uh, the spread of new media allows people to tailor their news consumption to political tastes. People prefer to encounter information that is politically agreeable to them, or people seek out information about subjects that are particularly important or interesting to them and ignore other subjects. The answer is A, seeking out political information is a matter of generic political interest. People absorbed by politics tune into all forms of news while the rest tune out politics. So there are three theories of selective exposure. Iyengar talks about them. The three theories of selective exposure are the attentive public, partisan polarization, and then the issue public under uh, the attentive public. People interested by politics tune into all forms of the news, whereas the apolitical or the people that aren't interested in politics pay very little attention to news in any medium, political news in any medium, uh, for partisan polarization. The second theory, people prefer to encounter information that supports their beliefs and avoid information that is inconsistent with said beliefs. And then the third theory is the issue public, uh, people seek out information about subjects that are particularly important or interesting to them and then tune out information about other subjects. And so we talk about horse race 
journalism so much in passing too. Actually, no, this is not supposed to be here. No, we don't talk about campaigns. We're skipping this question. I could have swore I removed it. My bad, y'all. We did not talk about that. Yes. All right, there we go. Which of the following genres of news programming has the largest daily audience? Is it cable news, national broadcast news, local television news, or network webcasts? I got one for A. And A is not the answer. We got one for C. Two for C, three for C. The answer is, why are we doing with this? Why is it loading? What's going on here? It's C, the answer is C. Local television news, largest daily audience. Why? Because most people want to know what's going on locally, like traffic reports and the weather. So yes, local TV news, largest daily audience. Next question. Agenda setting in the media can be described as which of the following? Media changes our minds about issues with persuasive commentary. The media changes the criteria we use to evaluate political issues. Those issues that get the most coverage are ranked as most important or all of the above. We got one for D, all of the above. Two for D. Three for D. Nope. C. Those issues that get the most coverage are ranked as most important. The more a story is reported in the media, the more important it's perceived to be by the media. So right now, coronavirus is the most important. That's all the media is talking about. And so that is number one on the agenda as determined by the media, or that's what the media wants to be number one or on our agenda. It goes back to that chart I showed you that shows the agenda setting process that shows, you know, outside events and gatekeeping events. Then it's the media's agenda, then the public's agenda, and then the policy agenda. And so the more often that the media reports on a, a specific issue or a specific item, the more important it is perceived by the media. And so it should be on the top of the agenda. So we talked about it a little bit in passing when we were talking about the role of uh, the role of a press in a democratic society. Blank refers to journalism that exposes misconduct in government and calls for reforms. Is this a feeding frenzy? Is this muckraking? Is this agenda setting? Or is this all of the above?
note takers? The correct answer is muckraking. So journalism that exposes misconduct in the government and calls for reforms is known as muckraking. Yep, yep. When analyzing media messages, which of the following question or questions are most important with respect to becoming more media literate? Who created this message and why it's being sent? What creative techniques attracted my attention and what values, lifestyles, and viewpoints are or not included in the message? How might people, how might different people understand this message differently? Or is it A and C? Or is it A, B, and C? We got one for D. It's E, A, B, and C. You need to know who created this message and why it's being sent what techniques are being used to attract your attention and what values, lifestyles, and viewpoints are or not included, then of course, how might different people understand this message differently? So there's, there's just so many examples from the coronavirus. There's just so, so many. So let's see. I'm trying to remember. I can't remember who the source was. Oh, I know what it is. Of course, it's the Daily Mail, but as we learned from the media bias chart, it's not real news, but it was going in about this article uh, trying to uh, argue why, uh, it was brief, why Donald, Donald Trump's assertion of the coronavirus being the Chinese virus was actually right. And so, of course, it's arguing everything and not even acknowledging the whole racism aspect of it and promoting the old stereotype of yellow peril. That's an example. Where are we? How many more questions do we have? Oh yeah, you need to know this. What are the four roles? Which of the following are the four roles of media that the media can perform in a society? I know that's a throwback. Is it information storage, dissemination, utilization, and creation? Is it surveillance, performance, socialization, and popularity? Is it access, interpretation, activism, and manipulation? Or is it surveillance, interpretation, socialization, and manipulation? And then after the end of this question, I'll go back to the previous one and explain why do we need to know where a message came from. I guess while people figure out this answer, I can go back and explain why, why does it matter? Why does it matter? Why does the source of a message matter? Because there are some sources out there that are not credible. They're not trustworthy. They're known to provide fake information or problematic information. Go back to the slides that show the uh, ways in which Media sources have been placed on a spectrum between uh, liberal and conservative leaning, yeah, liberal and conservative leanings, as well as the extent to which they provide truth versus fiction. It helps you uh, quantify and qualify your news sources better. It ties back to why even, you know, Wikipedia refuses to use the Daily Mail. You're far more likely to take a message from the Washington Post or from ABC, from CNN, 
more likely you're you're more likely to view those as more credible sources than you would a random blog. So like recall if you did find a niche or an indie blog for me for the partisan blog assignment, you're far less likely to like use that as your primary source of news as opposed to say CNN, the Wall Street Journal, even your local news websites. You're probably more likely to rely on the Delaware Gazette more than you are the Blaze depending upon, you know, where you are. That's why. Anyways, back to this question. The four roles that the media can play in society. D, surveillance, interpretation, socialization, and manipulation. Goes back to all those Birdman gifts. Everybody said A, A, A. It's not that. It's surveillance, interpretation, socialization and manipulation. This is Dunway and Graber chapter one or chapter two. And so let's see, I wanna make sure that everybody have a chance to read it. Which of the following is not an illustration of how the internet has changed how citizens participate in the political process? Interactive websites are more efficient two-way communication between politicians and the public. Uh, social, uh, social networking enables citizens to participate in discussions with political campaigns as well as with each other. Uh, campaigns develop and use email lists to inform citizens and encourage them to volunteer or donate. Uh, supporter produced viral videos can help generate homespun support and greater exposure for campaign messages or political rumors can be tracked and refuted with greater efficiency and speed. Which of the following is not an illustration of how the internet has changed the ways in which, how not, not the ways in which, changed how citizens participate in the political process? Have one for E, one for B. E is an echo, B is in Bravo. The correct answer is. It's E. E is the correct answer. Political rumors can be tracked and refuted with greater efficiency and speed. Nope, nope, nope. They cannot. No, they cannot. Trying to think of what is the rumor from 2016? Oh, yeah, that Bill Clinton has a black son. That's still floating around out there. So what political activities are the Huffington Post, Daily Mail, and Drudge Report websites are known for? Is it activist reporting, breaking news, online petitions, political commentary, or is it B and D? We have one for E.
answer is E, B and D, breaking news and political commentary. I heard allegations that the new coronavirus bill uh, proposed by the Democrats has a lot of Green New Deal stuff in it. And it doesn't have like the thousand dollars. It doesn't have my stimulus check in there. It is instead like trying to expand employment, unemployment benefits. That's the one you're talking about, right? Anyways, networks that are centrist in their politics, such as CNN, oftentimes lose out to networks with a fierce group of supporters, such as MSNBC and Fox News, because MSNBC and Fox News are fair and balanced news networks, thinking people's news networks, partisan news news networks, partisan news networks, or liberally biased news networks. Yeah, and it was like, thanks to that new, uh, so Danny says C, but like, thanks to that new Democrat bill, the stimulus uh, bill, yeah, the yeah the stimulus bill fell through. I hope they get it together because I want my $1,000 check to spend on shenanigans, all the shenanigans. I mean, what else can I do besides stay in the house? So buy all the video games. I was told that I should look into uh, getting Animal Crossing. Which is like supposed to be like Farmville, but better. Yeah, I didn't play Farmville the first time around. Answer is C. MSNBC and Fox News are partisan news networks. You can like rewind this whole stream and learn all about that from the Lewandowski reading. Are we done yet? Nope, because there's still a couple questions, but of course, once this is done, you know, you have everything you need to study for the exam. All of the following are correct regarding cable news, except I do have my tinfoil hat. My tinfoil hat is actually in the guest room. Uh, anyways, back to the question. Uh, it has intensified viewer partisanship. Uh, coverage is more in depth than local and network news. Uh, most viewers catch cable channels that conform, not catch, watch, woo, watch cable news channels that conform with their own political beliefs or that viewership peaked in the 90s and has since been on a steady decline. All of these are correct except which one? I said I can talk for days about like all the conspiracies about the coronavirus. So we got one for D, one for B. Two for D. Can we see the hat? I'm not supposed to get up. Like, I'm wearing like purple basketball shorts. I'm supposed like I'm professional from the neck up, you know? Perhaps for next week, I will whip out the tinfoil hat. But like, I can show like my toys. Or I can show my posters. Those are things I can show. I have like this TV over here. They have this TV here. That's like what I turn on to watch My Little Pony. That's half of my Black Butler poster. Can you wear it on Thursday? Sure, I can wear it on Thursday, but you know, that's exam day. There's not a stream happening Thursday. Anyways, the correct answer is, <laughs> while we wait for it to load. Yeah, all of these are correct about 24 hour news, except viewership peaked in the 90s and has since been on a steady decline. Uh, do we need to talk about horse race media? Mm. All horse race media talks to is the way in which it describes 
election developments, campaign developments in terms of sports style, describes them being like in a horse race and they're all thinking about if we start from the Iowa caucus and the New Hampshire primary all the way through the present day, talking about who's leading in, you know, who's leading in the polls, who secured this primary versus this caucus, et cetera, who's fallen to the back, who's lost their edge, et cetera. And so with that in mind of that very brief description of horse race media coverage of elections, does it increase voter interest in campaigns? Is it more politically substantive than regular coverage? Does it intend to ignore polling data or is it all of the above? I will find my tinfoil hat and I will show it. I'm not sure if I should wear it because of course, you know, these videos last forever. Last thing I need is for Princeton people or somebody who wants me to serve as a pundit see me on the YouTube wearing the tinfoil hat. That is not professional. That's not professional. Gosh, it's becoming slower and slower. Are there any others? Because sheesh, I need to finish this up. Oh, yeah. Blank refers to the primary means of mass communication of information. What is that? I know this is fill in the blank. Blank refers to the primary means of mass communication of information. Oh my God, I don't know what the answer is, y'all. Media. Don't forget the definition of media. Media refers to the primary means of mass communication of information. And then what is the official definition of political communication? That will also be on the midterm. And then actually, this is our last question. Hip, hip, hooray. All right. What is the official definition? A complex communicative activity in which language and symbols employed by leaders, media, citizens, and citizen groups all exert a multitude of, of effects on individuals in society, as well as on the outcomes that bear on public policy of the nation, state, or community. Don't forget about that definition of political communication. And that's the last question that's on this review session. That's it that I have for you all. Don't forget, midterm goes live early, early, early Thursday morning, and you will have until 11.59 p.m. Saturday to get it done. Once you start the exam, you'll have a 12-hour window. 
Uh, so you'll have until 11.59 p.m. Saturday or the end of your 12-hour window, whichever comes first. If you have any questions about the exam or if you have any glitches or whatever, please contact me. Do not wait until the last minute. Don't let Murphy's Law get you.